Hi, good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I want, my mother would refer to it as a raw day. This is a raw day. She lives near the ocean. And we're really happy to have you with us today and happy to have also with us two of our distinguished faculty, Janet Shapiro and Mirna Monharaj. Dr. Shapiro received her Bachelor of Science from Yale University and then her medical degree from Columbia University, followed by her internship and residency. And she'll often remind us she did that at Bellevue Medical Center back in the day. And then completed her fellowship in pulmonary medicine at Columbia. And finally, her fellowship in critical care here at Mount Sinai St. Luke's. And we got our hook into Janet during that time, and she's been with us ever since. And she is now a professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is the director of the medical intensive care unit at this hospital, and she is the interim chief of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine also at this hospital. Edward Dean Myrna Monharaj received her bachelor's degree at, at Johns Hopkins University and then her medical degree at, at the University of Connecticut. She then went on to complete her internship in residency and chief residency in the University of Chicago at Mount Sinai Hospital in critical care and pulmonary medicine. Both Janet and Myrna are really distinguished members of our faculty and received many, many awards during their time with us. Janet, for example, received the Mount Sinai St. Luke's President's Award in 2018 for distinguished service to this institution. Myrna was recognized as a promising junior faculty by the Mount Sinai St. Luke's West Alumni Association in 2017 an award that Janet herself received a number of years prior. They've also been recognized for their, for their work in education and their work in imbuing humanism into everything that we do, but certainly in the care we provide to patients in the intensive care unit. We all encounter moments with patients when we're aware that we're not quite connecting with them. And we're aware there might be something in their belief system, in their cultural, identity, something that takes them apart from us and what tr we're trying to achieve in their care. And in those moments, we know that there is perhaps an ethical dilemma, that what we feel is right for the patient isn't necessarily aligned with what the patient or their family believe is right for them. And in those moments too, we're so happy to have people like Myrna and Janet with us to help us navigate through perhaps some of the most challenging moments in our care of patients. And we're delighted to have them with us here today to talk about that very issue. In case it's not evident, you need to log on through your phones. The instructions are there, they're here, so that you can participate actively in the, in the lecture today. Welcome. Am I speaking to this one now? Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Samuel, for that uh, very gracious. Can you hear us or no? It's this top one right here? Okay. How about that? Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, terrific. Uh, Samuel, thank you so much for that very gracious uh, introduction. Um, I hope by now uh, everybody has logged on to our Poll Everywhere system. We're going to have some fun interactive ethical dilemmas uh, to work through, and we love your uh, participation. <clears throat> and I'm really honored to, to be co-presenting uh, this session with Dr. Janet Shapiro, um, started off as my kind of mentor and boss, now has become a, a real friend, and, and it's really an honor to stand next to her and give this presentation. And uh, what we'll be talking about today is the Mount Sinai St. Luke's West Ethics Program <clears throat> and how we support our ethical community. Um, through the course of this hour together, we'll be talking through the evolution of the Hospital Ethics Committee, um, a variety of frameworks for ethical reasoning and how we approach ethics dilemmas. Um, we'll have two fun interactive cases, and we hope that you'll join us through Poll Everywhere. I'll keep plugging that. Uh, if you're having trouble, just flag down one of the chief residents. They'll be happy to help you sign in. <clears throat> we'll then kind of shift gears to some more administrative issues, talking about how we've been transforming from a consultation service to a really robust ethics program. <clears throat> um, we'll address the interesting topic of ethical climate in a hospital institution, and then finally discuss our program in detail and talk about some of our initiatives and, uh, and outcomes. <clears throat> 
I'll start by talking about the evolution of the Hospital Ethics Committee. Um, back in the 1970s, there was scattered ethics committees across the country, but most of these really focused on isolated issues like research issues, sterilization, abortion rights. And then in 1976, some may remember this case, um, the case of Karen Quinlan, a 22-year-old woman with unfortunate anoxic brain injury, um, whose father and physicians disagreed about what was appropriate and whether she should be removed from life support. This case became before the New Jersey Supreme Court, and the court, in addition to their other recommendations, um, advised that the hospital should develop a prognosis committee in order to help adjudicate these issues. A few years later, about 1% of hospitals in the U.S. had a hospital ethics committee, and not surprisingly, 41% of them were in New Jersey, based on this case. And then a couple years later, a National President's Commission um, was advised, uh, saying that hospital ethics ethics committees should be uh, held in hospitals in order uh, to have a mechanism to address these ethical issues. Um, just a few years later, two more landmark cases uh, that made the national news and, uh, and involved government regulations. Uh, these were the baby doe cases and involved two, two infants who were born with congenital defects, um, where hospitals, uh, physicians, patients, families, and also the government had wide disagreements about what was considered discrimination against uh, an infant with a congenital defect. These led to um, <clears throat> the recommendations for infant review committees uh, to help navigate what was called the baby doe regulations. By the end of the 1980s, many more hospitals had ethics committees. And in 1992, Congress okay. passed what's called the Patient Self-Determination Act. And among their recommendations were that hospitals and physicians had the responsibility to patients and to their hospital communities to educate on how the patient has rights to become a part of their own decision making and also to advise on advanced directives and educate communities. And then finally, in 1992, Jaco got on board and made this a formal process that all hospitals must have an ethics committee to resolve ethical issues. Um, when talking about bioethics consultation, <clears throat> I'll talk through the definition, the aim, and the, and the um, wished for outcome. We define ethics consultation as a set of services provided by an individual or a group um, in order to resolve uncertainty or conflict regarding value-laden concerns that emerge in healthcare. And this aim, and I really love the wording here because I feel like this is you know, the sentiment and the mission of our ethics committee, we hope to honor each patient's dignity and values to mitigate conflicts, balance ethical principles, and promote, provide emotional support to patients loved ones, and the healthcare team by placing the values and experiences of the patient at the center of the deliberation. And overall, of course, our overall goal is to improve the quality of healthcare. <clears throat> I've listed here just a few of the reasons and goals of ethics committees and why consults are called, everything from patients' rights supports to resolving conflict, educating staff on ethical issues, um, and really the list is far wider than this. Now, I know everybody in the room is, is familiar with the school of principalism. It was kind of the one day and one slide of ethics I got in medical school. Um, and uh, it's how many of us approach basic ethical problems that we, we find every day. We think about principalism as a concept in a school of uh, moral thought that's rooted in autonomy, that a patient has agency to make decisions for their own life, for their own health care. And we balance autonomy <clears throat> with beneficence doing what's right or in the best interest for the patient, with non-maleficence, avoiding harm, and with justice, making sure that all patients and all humans really are treated equitably. Now, a little bit more fine-tuning on autonomy. Um, not infrequently, we find ethical dilemmas that arise when a competent patient, so one who technically has autonomy, makes choices that are contrary to their prior beliefs or their value commitments. And we ask when a conflict like this arises, are they truly autonomous? So we've really taken on this practice of looking not only at agency, which is a patient's moment-to-moment -moment capacity to decide on the basis of reasons and make a choice, but also on a concept called authenticity. <clears throat> this is exercised over time, and it's a patient's ability to construct their life in accordance with their true distinctive beliefs. Now, what we didn't discuss as much in medical school or internship or residency um, are these alternate moral frameworks. And really, when we make regular life decisions and approach ethical issues, we're kind of bringing in pieces of all of this into our reasoning. And we try to do this on our ethics committee as well. And I'll walk through some of these frameworks and just give a quick sample of, of the, 
nutshell thinking of each of them. <clears throat> uh, a utilitarian approach really thinks about the balance between good and bad, and right or wrong is depending on that balance. A Kantian approach is very strict about rules and duty. It's right or it's wrong. We can never harm anyone, and everybody has to agree on what a rule is and that it's right. A communitarian approach says that we should emphasize the communal values, do what's right for the common good. <clears throat> Rights-based approaches really care about legality. Is there a legal precedent? If not, then it's kind of a gray issue. The ethics of caring, which is rooted in feminist ethics, says that moral action really centers on caring. Other people related to the patient are impacted by the consequences and choices and deserve consideration in proportion to their vulnerability or the patient's vulnerability. And then finally, virtue ethics is a little bit gray in my mind still, um, but really says that physicians have moral character based on experience, practical wisdom, compassion, empathy, and that really informs behavior. So one virtuous physician compared to a differently virtuous physician might recommend different uh, outcomes. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, we'll start with the, our first case uh, for, um, for your input. Our first patient uh, was a 42-year-old woman who was admitted following an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, she had suffered prolonged, uh, required prolonged CPR. At 48 hours in the intensive care unit, she lost all brain stem reflexes. However, severe shock and metabolic disturbances prevented the medical ICU team from uh, pursuing the formal brain death determination. Uh, this case was complicated by complex family dynamics. There was a large family. Uh, the patient had young <laughs> children. Her husband was accused uh, of abusing her by other family, her other family members. And there were physical altercations in the intensive care unit. An ethics consultation was requested to uh, help in determining the proper surrogate for this patient the conflict. Uh, we explained the process of brain death determination that, that was going to be undertaken, um, including the accommodations that we would always make uh, for family, offering second opinions if desired. The family denied the possibility that the patient could, could be brain dead, uh, reported reading about patients who had awakened after doctors informed the family that the patient uh, was dead. Uh, they had hope. They believed in a miracle. On the fourth uh, ICU day, the patient suffered a cardiac arrest. The family, uh, the large family, was present in the room and begging the team to save the patient. So we'll start with our first question on poll everywhere. So the question is, should the MIC team perform CPR on this patient? And if your answer is yes, please answer A. And if if your answer is no, they should not perform CPR, please answer B. It's changing a little bit here. <laughs> Usually there's a place to see how many people have responded. Your faces. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, oh, which, which is right, which really? is right. Uh, uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so I'm going to lock these results here. Ah, very good. Uh, okay, well, thank you. It seems like most people thought that the team should perform uh, CPR. Should we ask for if uh, if there's perhaps one person who would want to say, perhaps somebody who said that we should not perform CPR. Um, briefly, if there's anyone at the west side of here who who would like to offer an opinion, or yes, it, it, it's okay if not. That's that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. But the majority felt that the team should perform CPR. Okay. Well, uh, we'll get to what happened to this patient. Uh, but but first, just a few words about brain death. And brain death um, uh, was. Uh, determined to be a definition of death, starting in, originating in 1968 by the Ad Hoc Committee of the Harvard Medical School. And this equated brain death with death. And this was incorporated in the Uniform Determination of Death Act in 1981. And the development of the concept of brain death occurred kind of in parallel with the need for organs and tissues and organ donations 
And so on a practical level, brain death allowed um, organ donation to occur and lives to be saved, but also it, it, the, the fact of organ donation really does have an effect on how people consider brain death um, diagnosis and, and what's out there in the, you know, in the lay press. So one of our roles we feel in ethics is to bring into the conversation what others believe about brain death, what do families believe, what are their religious and moral beliefs, and also what do families see in, on the internet, in the press, about, about brain death that affects their understanding and their deep beliefs when we tell families that a patient is brain dead. And so at this time in 2019, it's hard to talk about brain death and what the public sees about brain death without discussing the case of Jahai McNabb. And there are classic cases that Dr. Mohan Raj had talked about, but the case of Jahai McNabb over the past few years is a case that we have brought into the ICU to discuss uh, uh, with the ICU team. These are articles in the New Yorker, What Does It Mean to Die, in the pulmonary critical care literature about the case of Jahai McMath. She was a 13-year-old girl uh, who in the year 2013 underwent a tonsillectomy at a hospital in California. This was complicated by massive hemorrhage and cardiac arrest. This girl was declared brain dead uh, in the intensive care unit, and the family was approached for organ donation. The family did not believe that the patient was brain dead, hired a lawyer, and this case played out in the courts and in the media. Um, ultimately, uh, the patient was declared brain dead. Uh, the patient uh, was um, brought to the coroner's office on a ventilator, um, and a death certificate was issued. The patient was taken to another hospital where a tracheostomy and feeding tube was placed, and she was transported to a hospital in New Jersey where she was stabilized and then released to an apartment in New Jersey on a respirator with a feeding tube under the care of her family. So that this patient was declared dead in the state of California, but in New Jersey where family objection on moral uh, grounds for brain, uh, brain death determination of death was, it was acceptable uh, uh, to be continued on life support, that she was not considered brain dead there. Uh, Jahai McMath, um, lived uh, for five years in this condition and just suffered a cardiac arrest uh, several months ago. During this time, she started to menstruate, which I think raises a lot of questions for clinicians about brain death. But also, the family uh, posted pictures, posted videos, uh, had birthday parties for, uh, for the patients. So one of the things that we would see would be that if we looked at what is out there, uh, for uh, patients' families to see about brain death, uh, there would be a lot of other information that I think would be surprising to physicians. This was an article published in CHEST, uh, our main uh, pulmonary critical care journal, about uh, public perception of brain death using the internet. And what the authors did was looked at two, uh, at the top 10 Google and YouTube uh, sites to see what kind of content was out there, what kind of comments, what kind, uh, what kind of information is out there um, for the lay public. And uh, the case of Jahai McMath is in two of the top Google websites, and here's a picture from her, one of her, from her Sweet 16 party, and there are pictures and uh, videos of her moving her foot, you know, in, you know the, reportedly in response to um, family uh, requests. Some of the themes that we would see there, and these are um, uh, comments that we've heard in the intensive care unit, um, that the doctors won't give patients a chance to fight for their life, ready to pull the plug, harvest the organs. We don't like to say harvest the organs. Um, uh, doctors are vultures. Um, was the patient really dead? Um, uh, what is the religious perspective? These are other comments. The patient may be dead from the point of view of medicine, but what about the point of view of God? So, and, and lastly, um, the New York Times, uh, one of the columnists uh, for the opinion pages of the New York Times wrote this article, uh, Cardiologist in New York, um, last month, what is, what is Death? And really giving some of the history of uh, brain death, the differences uh, uh, among the states, the different perceptions of, of, of different groups, Native Americans, Evangelical Protestants, Orthodox Jews, 
who don't who don't accept a brain death uh, diagnosis, and concludes with this incredible paragraph that I just that I wanted to share, that our definition of death is man-made. In the spectrum between alive and dead, we set the threshold, and we can do so in response to biological, ethical, and even practical considerations. So bringing in the need for organs there into our definition of death. Death is not a binary state or a simple biological fact, but a complex social choice. I think that that is just so, such an incredible way uh, to think about this. So we have our next question. So I think you could imagine, uh, I think as a lot of you suggested that CPR should be performed on this patient, and if CPR um, was performed, it would likely be performed with the idea that the patient was not going to survive. Uh, so we might term this a slow code. Are slow codes ever ethically acceptable? And uh, if you could answer here, um, if you think, yes, they are acceptable, answer A, and no, answer B. We're hiding your responses this time. <laughs> So I think everyone familiar about um, slow codes. I mean, I think for as long as my lifetime in medicine, people have talked about the ethics of it. Yes. Ah, interesting. Um, so, so almost split. Um, uh, Fifty-seven percent said uh, they can be ethically acceptable, and some. Uh, 43% felt not ethically acceptable. Does anybody, if, if there's anybody who wants to offer an opinion, you're welcome to. Ah, uh, could you come up to the microphone? Our, our chaplain has an opinion. <laughs> it's a real pragmatic <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm it's sorry. Okay. I'm very loud. Uh, well, we have to for downtown. We have to. Uh, here. Oh, uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> the question is that if within the clinical team it's really felt that this patient <laughs> has deceased, a slow code, if this is what's going to help the family through to an acceptance of what's actually happened, is worth going through once. And then we can begin a better conversation. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much. Um, so is a slow code ethically acceptable? Thank you very much, Mary. So you know, from our um, a basic framework, a principle is, and we may say, well, this really does raise ethical uh, questions of deceit paternalism, trust in the doctor-patient relationships, teaching communication skills. I mean, you know, can we not communicate well enough to explain to a patient or family why a patient should or should not have um, CPR performed? But I think we look at the intentions. And in such a case where a family was not ready for the patient's death, we may spare the family the anguish of thinking that any treatment was withheld. And so, as uh, Dr. Mohan Raj mentioned, we have alternate moral frameworks to consider as well here. And uh, from a utilitarian um, perspective, well, we may say, well, there's little benefit to performing a code. Even a slow code may harm a patient. On the other hand, a Dantean perspective may say, well, we, we should obey the, um, the rules. The patient does not have a do not resuscitate order, and by rules should be resuscitated. And on the other hand, well, can we really harm a patient who's, who's coding? A rights-based approach would say that, well, legally the patient was not declared brain dead and was not DNR, so we should perform CPR. But I think the ethics of caring the feminist uh, approach um, would say that the care of the patient extends to the care of the family, so withholding CPR may traumatize the family. And I think even from an intuitive point of view, at, at the moment that this was happening, we didn't really go over all these alternate um, moral frameworks with the, with the team, but it was really a deeply felt um, from the team, from all the physicians, the nurses, the chaplains, the social workers, 
that this was really, you know, sort of the endogenous feeling that this was the right thing to do. So the medical code was run. It was run at a high level of leadership of the code in the ICU. The family was present during the code, holding the patient's hand, the chaplain and social workers supporting the family. Resuscitation efforts were, um, you know, obviously eventually ceased, and the family appreciated the efforts. This actually was the start of one of our programs in the ICU, which is the ICU Reflections, to allow the entire staff afterwards to debrief and, and discuss and hopefully mitigate some of the moral distress that could happen. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for your engagement. Uh, we're going to move on to our second case, um, also a real-life, ripped-from-the-headlines case. Um, so this is a, an 81-year-old gentleman who was admitted with a subacute, oh, I'm sorry, submassive acute PE and DVT. Um, he was admitted to the medical intensive care unit and treated with IV heparin. But the patient refused to believe that he had a PE. He was a pharmacist, and he said that as a pharmacist, I have knowledge that if I had a PE, I would have died, and there's no way that I have a PE if I'm alive. Um, he had a psychiatry evaluation uh, and was deemed to have paranoid delusions and also possibly dementia, and he continued to refuse anticoagulation, both IV and oral, um, because he said he didn't have a, a disease that needed anticoagulation, but he would accept other oral medications for acid reflux and for what he called his stomach problem. Despite a good faith effort, no surrogate was identified for the patient, and so we were called for an ethics consultation with this question. Given that the patient has a potentially life-threatening illness, is it ethically appropriate to tell the patient that the oral anticoagulation is a treatment for a stomach? So basically, can we lie to the patient? Um, so we're going to move to our first question of this case. Um, so <laughs> this is getting a little... Have you ever intentionally deceived or withheld information from a patient? And if it's yes, answer A. If it's no, answer B. Maybe 30 more seconds to tell us if you've ever lied to a patient. Deceived. <laughs> deceived sorry, deceived. <laughs> I should know better. <laughs> All right. So let's see. So pretty evenly split. split. So we have about half of our uh, audience. Uh, says that they have intentionally deceived a patient, and about 44% saying that, no, they've never intentionally does, done so. Um, so let's go back to our, uh, our case. Um, so when we were uh, approached with this, uh, the first, uh, first step that we took, and often the first step we took would take uh, in ethics consultations, is to assess medical decision-making capacity. In this particular case, the patient clearly could indicate a preferred option. He did not want the anticoagulation. But he didn't understand the fundamental meaning of the information. He was not able to appreciate the situation and the consequence of refusing anticoagulation, and he wasn't able to engage in a rational manipulation of the information. And therefore, we, we deemed that he did not have medical decision-making capacity to refuse anticoagulation. We then turn to our society guidelines on truth-telling, um, and we look at the AMA guidelines, the UK General Medical Council, the World Medical Association, and everyone has sort of a same tone and approach, is that generally physicians should be honest, and we should actually report our colleagues who are not being honest. But what they don't tell us in this wording is, does being honest mean never telling a lie? Does it mean never to hide the truth? And does it really mean to tell all to the patient, tell them all the gory details? Uh, in researching this, I was kind of blown away by the robust literature on whether or not physicians can lie and deceive their patients. And I put together a little pro-con list here based on the literature. Um, and so if you're in the pro-deception category, some of your arguments might be that, well, Deceiving patients is generally perceived as justifiable um, from, if you're withholding information from patients who appear incompetent at accepting such information. You might also argue that a duty to care for the patient may override your duty not to lie um, if deliberate deception is therapeutically necessary. And I think on a day-to-day -day basis as humans and physicians, we really often prioritize giving a true picture over telling the whole truth. So for example, if I'm consenting a patient for a bronchoscopy, even though there is a very small chance that the patient might die from the procedure, I don't tell them that. I don't include that in my verbal consent. 
And finally, well-intentioned deception only becomes illegitimate if it threatens dignity or autonomy. So pro-deceivers would say, as long as you're not threatening dignity or autonomy, then it might be okay. Now on the flip side, the anti-deceivers say that, well, intention is really all that matters. Being silent, being tactful or reserved with the truth is really tantamount to lying to a patient, not just deceiving a patient. Um, patients may inherently expect us as doctors to lie when appropriate. Um, many of us heard, have heard, break it to me gently, just give me a little bit of information at a time. But this really may encourage a form of uh, medical paternalism and the anti-deceivers would oppose this. Both lying and intentional deception risk breach of trust and threatened autonomy. And concealment, once it's begun, must likely be continued, not just by the concealer, but all of the other health practitioners, family, and people that follow. Uh, so it's not just a one-time decision. Now, if we approach this case again from sort of a principal standpoint, well, in this particular case, autonomy uh, was not in play. The patient did not have agency to make his own moment-to-moment -moment decisions. And unfortunately, without his input and without a surrogate's input, we really didn't have that authenticity component. How did he live his life? What did he value? Um, many of the physicians felt, well, it's clearly in his best interest uh, to give him anticoagulation. It could potentially save his life. Um, but this treatment is not without potential harm. Anticoagulation has potential risks. <clears throat> and finally, from a justice standpoint, one might consider that all patient, uh, uh, most patients would be treated with anticoagulation, and giving him the treatment, saving his life, might potentially get him to a point where he could be treated for a psychiatric illness and regain some autonomy. Um, so from a principal standpoint, that's sort of the approach. And then bringing in some of these alternate moral frameworks. So a utilitarian approach might say that potentially life-saving benefits of deceptive anticoagulation clearly outweigh the risks, so you should treat. A Kantian approach would say, lying is wrong. Any potential for complication is absolutely unacceptable. You should not deceive the patient and treat them. From a communitarian standpoint, the community is unlikely to be harmed by giving this one patient anticoagulation, so go ahead. And from a rights-based approach, there's really not a clear legal precedent to preclude deceptive anticoagulation, so it may be acceptable. And then finally, from an ethics of care standpoint, responding to the patient's true needs includes reassurance that the decept deceptively administered medicine is really for their own well-being. This particular patient is highly vulnerable because he's incompetent and he and any other parties really deserve deep attention. Um, so our final uh, question of the day, we'll move on to that. Here, can I just ask a question? Yes, please. So when the committee is weighing a judgment, I just want to get a sense, is it that you're kind of running through the different frameworks and sort of doing a tally and where you end up on one side versus the other has to do partly with, you know, if there's three versus two, that kind of thing. That's a great question. I, I think it's um, such an incredibly individualized process. Um, and I think that, I don't think we physically have sort of a weighing scale where there's, well, the, the Kantians and the utilitarians are on this side, but principalism is on this side, because at times, perhaps a Kantian argument might weigh more heavily than a utilitarian argument. So it's not that these are equal and opposite, um, but I think the thought is, is that we must be aware that there's different ways to think through different problems, um, and there's different moral schools of thought to guide us through that decision making. And so I, we bring these ideas and thought processes in based on the very individualized, um, that doesn't look good, <laughs> a very individualized approach to every particular patient. Um, does that answer your question? Um, yes. Okay. So moving on to our last question. Um, so in this particular case, is it ethically appropriate uh, to tell the patient that his oral anticoagulation is actually just a treatment for his stomach? If you think yes, it's appropriate to deceive the patient, say yes. If you think no, we can't deceive the patient, please answer B. Give you another 30, 40 seconds to answer. Okay. I'm going to lock the results and let's see what people think. Okay, so again, uh, an, uh, a, a nice distribution here. So about 30% of the, the people in the audience think, I think it's okay to, to tell the patient that this, um, you know, DOAC is a treatment for their uh, stomach. But 66% of uh, our audience thinks no. And I would really love if one of those 66%
um, maybe you want to tell us your thought process here or, or why you think it's inappropriate to deceive the patient. Anybody at West or, or Luke's feel brave to come up and uh, give your thoughts? No. Well, okay. I, I voted no. Okay. I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I just it just feels so ambiguous to me because it's a lot about first of all, it just feels there's a gut reaction. I just don't know how you do that day after day. Yeah. Uh, and then also it just feels like a moment where where how are you gonna make a decision about when to stop and those kinds of things. Uh, and then the only other thought I had, which led me in the direction of no, is if there were to be a complication, how do you engage that conversation with the patient? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so actually, Dr. Shapiro actually was the one who received this consult, and and she brought it to me, and I had the exact same gut reaction. I mean, she she said the look on your face, Mirna, when I asked you if we could lie to this patient, um, and and then she actually discovered this terrific and interesting article, and. When I was a med student, I don't think I would have ever believed there would be a deception flowchart article, <laughs> but there is indeed a deception flowchart. And we walked through this flowchart for our patient, and I'll tell you how we came out with this. So the first question, and I hope this projects okay, is, is your proposed action or omission deceptive? And indeed, it clearly is. And then what are your justifications for the proposed deception? In his case, it would be to prevent great or uh, physical or psychological harm. <clears throat> the patient is not emotionally or cognitively equipped to decide or to cope with the truth. And the decision may, in the long run, enhance his autonomy, as I mentioned, save his life, get him treated for a psychiatric illness, and ideally he'll be able to participate in his own decision-making months down the road. Given the circumstances and your assessment of the patient's mental state, is the deception attempt likely to succeed? And we felt that it was. He was accepting other medications um, and uh, readily taking them as long as he thought they were for his stomach. In that case, can the objectives be met without any recourse to deception? And clearly no, as Dr. Stewart just pointed out, you know, this potentially has complications. What if he starts bleeding? So there may be recourse. <clears throat> Will non-lying deception meet the objectives? And we again thought no. So for example, is this somebody where you could be just crushing up his anticoagulant every, every day and just mixing it up into his, uh, into his food and having him take it? Still a form of deception, but not a lying form of deception where we're physically telling him it's for something else. <laughs> so in this case, I know it's getting a little bit hazy here. <laughs> um, so in this case, the deception flowchart leads you to say, well, maybe you can consider lying to this patient. And then there's this big stop gap where we're really asked to go through a list of justifications and consider true objections to lying and non-lying deception. I won't go through every single one of these, um, but a couple of them are, well, there might be potential emotional distress if the lie or the deception is discovered. We may be failing to respect the autonomy of the patient in the immediate situation. Are we violating his right to know um, and his right to not be lied to or deceived to? And are we really appropriately balancing the risks and the benefits of, of the lying and the deception. And there's several more that we walked through. So the next question is based on these justifications and potential objections, do your justifications, uh, do the justifications for giving the medication outweigh the objections? And in this case, again, because we felt it was life, potentially life-saving, the answer was yes. It's 2019, so we have to ask the question if we would be prepared to defend our lie or deception at a hearing of your professional body or in a court of law. And while that's not an ethicist's role to say, as an ethical, ethic, or as ethicist, we felt that we would, but of course an administering physician would have to take this burden on as well. And then if aware of the facts, would the patient consent to the lie or deception in advance? And because the patient can't tell us, we use substituted judgment of what a reasonable patient would do. And we feel most reasonable patients would accept the anticoagulation. Um, so so-called, the author of the deception flowchart says that, well, you've arrived at the answer, proposed deception is morally permissible. Now, it might not be as, as black and white as that, um, and clearly this is not an evidence-based standard of care, but we did find it an interesting guide uh, to work through some of these processes. So, um, <laughs> As you guessed, uh, we uh, deemed from an ethical standpoint that it was ethically acceptable to deceive the patient because he lacked medical decision-making capacity. He had an untreated PE, which is associated with high mortality. The benefits of the anticoagulation were felt to outweigh the risks. Justification of deception also outweighed the risks. 
and preserving the patient's life might return him to autonomy in months to come. At this particular moment, it was thought that there was no threat to patient dignity and we were unlikely to breach long-term trust. And what made the case a little bit safer was that the patient was not going home. He was going to be going to a skilled nursing facility, being supervised with his medication administration. And once it was offered in this manner, he readily accepted the DOAC and he did believe it was for his stomach problem. Um, so if there's no burning questions there, I'd like to actually switch gears a little bit and thank you again for participating. It certainly made it a little bit more fun. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the logistical issues of running an ethics uh, service and how it differs from an ethics program. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, sort of uh, national bodies for bioethics and humanities in, in the United States, um, but despite this, um, there's really no formal consensus on the structure and function or best practices for ethics committees. Most hospital ethics committees just do consultation, um, and they may focus a little bit on policy work, but there's really very few institutions who conduct a holistic, multi-pronged ethics program. And the five major facet facets of an ethics program would be consultative services, educational activities, <clears throat> um, bioethics research, addressing system and policy changes, and attending to the institutional moral climate. This is our consultation service here. Um, myself and Dr. Shapiro based at St. Luke's and Dr. Raymond Jean and Dr. Grace Ferris based at Mount Sinai West. And we really have an amazing multidisciplinary uh, committee team. Many of here, them are here in the audience today. Thank you for coming. Representing palliative care and hospice, our house staff, our nurses and nurse management, our social workers, past patient relations, pastoral care, legal counsel. I have to call out Debbie Korsnick, who saves us on a weekly to monthly basis, um, and our faculty consultants, as I mentioned. Um, we do not have a community member yet on our committee, but this is a future goal. And many of the sort of uh, notable uh, ethics uh, programs in the, in the country to have this. Um, uh, in the past year, we've made a lot of changes to our program, uh, and one of the first is our accessibility and how you can reach us. Um, I hope that you're receiving our widely publicized Hospital Ethics Committee activities and educational material via our bi-monthly e-newsletter. Um, we are now listed on AMION at both sites, so we're readily available and identifiable on who's on call. Um, and we have an e-distribution list, um, and now you can reach us anyway. You can text us, call us, knock on our door. But this e-distribution list is really terrific because it sends the consult directly to all four faculty consultants. So not only is everybody aware, it just makes it easier for us to confer and get back to you in a timely fashion. And we're really proud to be part of the Mount Sinai Health System Ethics Consortium. Um, there's bi-month or quarterly retreats that happen, and we've been really uh, excited and proud to share our best practices and have some of them be adopted by other hospital ethics committees in the system. This is also kind of our coolest, newest innovation. Um, just uh, one of our uh, nurse managers is, is in the audience, and, and she's been uh, she's here <laughs> on this text. Um, so what we decided is that a lot of our ethics consults were just being done by these four faculty consultants. And how can we better educate our committee members and other people in the community on how the process actually goes down? Um, so what we devised was this WhatsApp group. Um, when we get a consultation, we basically just send out um, you know, a HIPAA-compliant notification to the group, and it's first come, first serve. So we've had fellows join, we've had nurses join, and now we have a team of faculty and a non-faculty consultant who do these ethics consults together. All of our consults are bedside consultations with in-person interviews with key stakeholders. We perform case review and ethical analysis, and typically, <clears throat> unless it's an incredibly straightforward case, we discuss it with at least one other faculty member in the committee. Key committee members, like from legal, pastoral care, social work, are engaged as needed for their specific expertise. And on occasion, I'd say about once a year, we have to assemble the entire ethics committee for incredibly complex cases. We do leave a note in Epic, and we do not bill for our services. And I'll say that, you know, as I mentioned, there's no consensus on practice. Um, not every uh, committee in, in the hospital system or in the country does these types of practices. Uh, many of them are a little bit more removed from the bedside. <clears throat> In terms of our educational activities, um, uh, we meet bi-monthly um, and we televise our meetings between St. Luke's and West and anyone is welcome to join. Um, we perform evidence-based review of our active and recent consultations and we review pertinent and emerging literature, um, both from the medical literature and also from the active press. 
Um, we also um, <clears throat> uh, strategize on our bi-monthly educational activities, and we really try to target various audiences from various different di divisions um, and from different levels, um, nursing, uh, house staff, faculty. Um, and this is just a, an embarrassing picture of me at the, at the most recent Mount Sinai retreat. Okay. So uh, I want to shift a little bit um, after Dr. Mohamed was talking about our, eth our ethics committee. I feel like this is what we are aspiring to do, and that is to address the whole ethical climate at the hospital center, uh, addressing moral distress and the ethical climate. And I take this uh, uh, quote from the AMA Journal of Ethics um, you know, to share with you. The reality is that if the weighty responsibilities of competent, compassionate care and treatment are to be borne without staff being overburdened by their responsibilities. Healthcare organizations must be morally habitable so that space exists for ethical reflection. And I think that probably that's something that we all feel. Um, we have a lot of responsibility, a lot of burdens, and we have to, we have to tend to the ethical climate uh, of, this, of the institution. And so what is moral distress and the ethical climate? Well, moral distress is the stress that's associated with the ethical dimensions of the healthcare practice. And so feeling the failure to fulfill uh, your own uh, professional and moral values and standards because of other constraints, um, that we're con certain about the ethical course, but we're constrained to do so. And some examples would be for nurses feeling that, say, the staffing is inadequate so that they can't do the best that they can be for us to feel that we think that, say, a, a dying patient is at the end of their life, yet still we must continue <laughs> life support. Nurses, um, and I thank our ICU nurse, uh, Jess, who's here, um, I, I, there's a lot of literature um, in the nursing literature about moral distress, and some of it related to a power imbalance, that the physicians write the orders, the nurses carry out the orders, and I think that that's something to be attuned to, how we communicate and how we work and make decisions um, as a team. Moral distress is associated with decreasing satisfaction, with burnout, attrition, and unsafe uh, patient care. And sort of uh, overall encompassing this is our ethical climate. The ethical climate is the, um, refers to the organizational practices and conditions that promote um, discussion resolution of ethical issues. And so it is how we feel that we can access support and advice for ethical concerns and, and moral distress. And there are surveys um, that, that uh, address both moral distress and the ethical climate, and a lot in the nursing literature, and really showing that, you know, if there's a higher moral distress among staff, it really reflects a worse ethical so I think that you know we may not be able to control some of the areas that lead to some moral distress, but what we can control is the ethical climate. And here is one of the articles, I think one of the key articles in the critical care literature, looking at um, moral distress and ethical climate in, in the critical care unit. And this was about nurse physician perspectives published in Critical Care Medicine 2007, and I think the exact same questions are present in 2019, looking at physicians and nurses um, uh, using a moral distress score, hospital uh, ethical climate survey, and looking at areas of moral distress. And I think that the, the top areas of moral distress in critical care nurses and physicians are situations where the clinicians follow the family's wishes to continue life support, even though not in the patient's best interest, you know, in the view of the clinician, initiating life-saving uh, life actions that only prolong death, doing CPR on a patient who really is at the end of their life, uh, continuing uh, to participate when no one is making a decision uh, about life support, following orders for aggressive treatments that are unnecessary for terminally ill patients. And these, these same causes of moral distress are present today. Now, we may still have those concerns as individuals, but I think how we, um, from an ethical point of view, can elevate the ethical climate is to really upfront address those issues and say, go to the bedside, go to the ICU, to the CCU, and explain why we continue to provide 
uh, life support to such a patient because we respect shared decision making, because we respect patient autonomy in assigning their surrogate, because we respect the laws on um, CPR in the United States. And so how I think we aspire to improve the ethical climate at the hospital is by several facets that we would like to be involved in from ethics um, uh, as an ethics program, but really everybody is involved in. We, we think that we need explicit discussions of these uh, areas of moral distress, recognizing the differences uh, in physician and nurse values and, 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 and improving the collaboration by really you know, thinking about the interprofessional respect and communication um, making ethics a part of everyday life of, of the hospital by educating, by including others in our ethics consultations, by reviewing an ethics consultation with the entire team um, at the bedside. Um, uh, education will strengthen our individual and systemic responses to moral distress. The moral life of the hospital, understanding other, um, other uh, perceptions and beliefs bringing in cases of Jahai McMath uh, to, to rounds uh, in the ICU, uh, instituting some of the programs that we've been trying, such as IC Reflections in the ICU. And something that we, we, we really try to bring out to the rest of the hospital is even the moment of silence at the time of a cardiac arrest in the ICUs and outside of the ICUs. There is no literature on how to quantify the moral impact of hospital ethics committees. But uh, I be we believe that this is where we want to be moving uh, as a committee in terms of improving the ethical climate. Um, and then shifting again now to uh, the last uh, facet of a robust ethics program, um, which is bioethics research. Um, and we really started to, to think about how can we contribute with our, our program that's kind of growing and innovating uh, to the existing uh, ethics literature. Um, about nine months ago, uh, we developed in Red Caps a, a, a bioethics database um, for the St. Luke's West Consultation Service. And we're prospectively collecting information <clears throat> on these consults. Um, uh, we collect some basic demographic information, um, the reasons for the consultation, often it's more than one, um, brief descriptions of what the ethical question is, what our ethically acceptable recommendations are, um, and the time and resources invested into these consultations. How many meetings are we having with stakeholders? How many hours is this taking? How often are we engaging other personnel like legal, pastoral, social work, and who are the people that we're engaging? And then, of course, the outcome of the uh, consultation as well. Um, this is a, a very brief snapshot of our sort of data over the last nine months. Um, <clears throat> between the two hospitals, we perform about four consultations a month. Um, and uh, compared nationally, that's actually on the higher end. Um, if we look at the global realm of, of hospitals in, in the U.S., many of these are non-academic, smaller community hospitals. And on average, those hospitals do about one to four consultations a year. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is uh, the Harvards and the Emory's of, of the country, um, where they're doing about eight consultations a month. Um, so I really think we have a, a quite a busy service um, and actually one of the busiest in the Sinai system as well. We hope that reflects on our accessibility and responsiveness um, and, uh, and we hope to stay as busy or even busier. Um, almost 50% of our consultations come from the critical care realm, not surprising, thinking about the, uh, all the ethical issues surrounding end-of-life care. Um, we typically invest about two hours in each consult, um, <clears throat> but again, this can go up to about five for more complex cases. Um, and last year, when we had an incredibly complex case that involved the entire um, uh, uh, group of the, of the committee, um, this was upwards of uh, seven hours that we invested in that case. Two-thirds of the time, uh, we're discussing cases with another faculty consultant. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we haven't assembled a committee for a case since June, um, but we do anticipate about once a year that we will do that. Um, and then finally, um, our consultation data. Um, so you can see this is the frequency with which we're employing uh, the use of our other non-faculty committee members. Um, I'm sorry, not committee members, the um, other sort of services in the hospital and support personnel. Um, by far and away, our social workers, incredibly helpful and necessary um, in the search and, and decision making about surrogates. Um, legal counsel, chaplain, and patient advocate are also up there. <clears throat> and this is the frequency of the type of consultations we get. 
the most frequent being about end-of-life decision-making, identification of a legal or appropriate surrogate, conflict over care plan, patient treatment refusal, um, <clears throat> and assessment of a patient's medical decision-making capacity. Um, so we hope that gives you kind of a, a basic framework and how to think through an initial ethics consultation. Certainly it's a complex thing, and, and that's why we're here to help guide you through this. And I hope you also have an understanding of our ethics program and, and what we've been working on, uh, what we hope to do, um, and, and how we hope to grow is a little bit on this slide. Um, in the future, from a bioethics and research standpoint, um, what we're interested in is looking at, well, how do we know we're being successful? What makes us think that we are doing an appropriate job or are doing a good job in attending to our consultative services and the ethical climate of the hospital? Um, we have the opportunity to do some retrospective data collection. <clears throat> um, the Harvard uh, Bioethics Database, is um, they did a retrospective review and they really take uh, much more information than we're collecting right now. Uh, retrospectively looking into patient demographics, racial uh, uh, backgrounds, socioeconomic status, education level, et cetera, and thinking about how all of these different factors might relate to physicians' implicit bias, why certain patients get a consult and others don't. And then, of course, as always, we'd love more house staff engagement. We have a few house staff, or actually several house staff on our, on our committee from various different departments. And if anyone is interested in taking on some of these research projects, uh, we would absolutely love to mentor you through that. In terms of educational activities, we will hope to continue the activities that we're doing. But with the data that we have, we actually can um, sort of uh, make these more data-driven education efforts. Clearly, our ICUs are a place where we can focus more education on legal and end-of-life issues. Um, and so that's one way that we can target our education practices. Um, we, we're already conducting seminars across various hospital divisions. If anyone is interested in having us come to speak to your trainees or to your division, we'd be happy to do that. And we're exploring opportunities at the medical school level as well. From a consultative service growth uh, perspective, uh, as I mentioned, we're hoping to engage a community member um, to really bring a patient voice to these consultation discussions. And we're thinking about um, doing a standardized documentation um, uh, process. Uh, some hospitals or ethics committees don't leave notes. Um, some do, and it's very variable whether it's written in a standardized fashion or not. Um, I think Dr. Shapiro really addressed the attention to the moral climate beautifully, um, and we have growing projects, including, including the Moment of Silence project, the ICU Narrative project, which you can talk to about uh, with anybody who's interested, and thinking about, well, how can we quantify the institutional moral impact of our program and our activities? And then finally, um, you know, central to all of this is the patient and the family, <clears throat> and we do have uh, a policy that anybody, including a patient or a family member, can consult the ethics service. But how do they know that? How do they understand that, that what the service is and that they have access to that? Um, and then we do hope to continue to broadly e-communicate all of our activities uh, with the community. I'll end on, on this as just a reminder that anybody may call an ethics consultation. It doesn't matter uh, what your background, who you are, um, as long as you have a vested interest in the patient. Um, and this is how you can most easily reach us through our e-distribution list. But again, I think all of you have our cell phone numbers. Pretty much everybody in this room has our cell phone numbers. So you can text call or just come by our office anytime. Um, and with that, I think we'll thank you for your attention um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you.